This series of screencasts will be on divide and conquer and recurrence relations. We'll introduce the two in this screencast, and then in the subsequent screencasts, we'll look at different ways of solving the recurrence relations. The view is from of Mauna Kea, a view of Mauna Kea's own shadow at sunset. Okay, reviewing what we introduced in the uh, second screencast series, the divide and conquer strategy might be called divide, conquer, and combine because what we do is first we divide into subproblems that are instances of the same problem. And then we conquer by solving them recursively or if the subproblems are simple enough, brute force. And then we combine into a solution to the original problem. Divide and conquer often works with recursive algorithms because we will be solving smaller subproblems of the same type through recursive calls. And eventually you hit a base case, or one or more base cases, the uh, small problems that you can just solve with brute force or trivially. And those are usually done in theta of one time. So we need to pay the cost, d of n, of dividing up the problem. Uh, we need to pay the cost of combining the, into solution of the original problem. We're going to call that c of n. This is all review. Um, but we've divided it up in, uh, into subproblems. And often it has the form where we divide it up into a subproblems, 1 over b size of original. So if you put that all together into a formula, you get the classic recurrence relation. The time it takes to solve a problem of size n is going to be the time it takes to divide the problem up in the subproblems, the time it takes to solve a subproblems, each of which is going to be t of 1 over b, and the time it takes to combine. So this is the classic form of the formula. Of course, we're going to have a case where if t of 1 will be theta of 1. It's the base case. And sometimes you need to cover t of 2 for some reason as well. But we, in the asymptotic case, we just worry about, um, we don't worry too much about the small base cases. As an example of this, let's look at merge sort. The base case is solved trivially when there is nothing really to sort. So that's going to be theta of 1. The divide term here is going to be also constant time to perform the math to divide the array in half. Now we make two calls. So a is equal to 2. And each of these arrays is roughly half the size of the original array. So b is equal to 2 in this case. And then the merge procedure itself, you may remember, has to run through both of the sublists. So it's checking a total of n elements to um, merge them together. So that's theta of n. So we can write this recurrence relation for merge sort like this. The base case is theta of 1. Let's say if n is less than 2. And otherwise, it's uh, 2 for the a is 2 there. The time it takes to solve problems of size 1 half, because b is 2, plus the time it takes to do the divide and the time it takes to do the conquer. But theta of n plus theta of 1 is really theta of n, is the dominating term. It's important to note that not all recurrence relations follow this form. Uh, we can have um, problem-solving strategies that give us different forms of relations. Later in the set of screencasts, we're going to see some examples where a and b are not one half, but it doesn't even have to follow the pattern of a t 1 over b. Uh, for example, suppose we want to do something to all elements in the array, such as search for the minimum or add them up. And our strategy is to do a, uh, to write a procedure that calls itself recursively on the rest of the array and then takes the results and combines that with the first element. For example, summing all the other, other elements and then adding the first element. The base case would be when you only have one element or zero elements, then you just return zero. Cursive case is where you're going to have uh, 
uh, one subproblem uh, because from the standpoint of being in the call that's looking at this cell, you only call yourself recursively once. You know, of course, eventually you're going to call yourself n minus one times, but that's down the chain. So a is one, uh, b is n minus one, constant amount of time required for the rest. So the recurrence relation for this would look like something like this. The time it takes to solve one problem of n minus one size plus theta of one for doing the you know, adding in the last element. So that doesn't even fit this form. But many of our divide and conquer uh, problems do fit this form, where there is take a problem, divide it up into pieces of which you have to solve sometimes more than one, not always. Remember with binary search, A was one and B was, was two. So now let's, um, let's look at a different example of a uh, divide and conquer strategy. Suppose we're given arrays of numbers and we want to find the maximum subarray, a range of the array that gives the maximum sum of elements. In a very large array, it may not be at all, all obvious <coughs> where that subarray is. A uh, brute force strategy would be to look at every possible pair of indices into the, the array. Yeah, so, for example, if we're going to look at subarrays from i to j, we might run uh, i from 1 to n minus 1, j from i plus 1 to n, and then look at all pairs, possible pairs of indices, add up the numbers in their range, and then uh, find the one that has the maximum sum. Uh, that wouldn't be too cool. That would be theta of n squared because you're running i and j up through all, um, well, almost all of the elements of the array. So we don't want to do that. But a, there's a recursive uh, solution to this, and that is to divide the subarray into two arrays of equal size. Um, so we find the midpoint um, here, right? So we will call it recursively on this subarray, let's say that's a uh, recursive call there, and we're going to call it uh, recursively on this subarray to find the maximum subarray in each of these two. But we need to now move this down a bit here because the maximum subarray, there's a third situation where it could fall not in the left half or the right half strictly but it could fall on the boundary, it could cross this boundary here. So that would look like this. There's possibly some maximum subarray. Actually, we don't know exactly where these, these uh, boundaries are here. We would have to check the whole thing. But it's possible that the maximum subarray crosses the boundary. So we have three situations. Either it is in the left half or it's in the right half or it is crossing the boundary. Actually, it turns out that the solution to this particular array is right here. It indeed crosses the boundary. That's the maximum subarray. But what's the structure of the solution? It's a divide and conquer. So we divide into two subarrays of equal size. We recurse on each of these. We conquer by applying the same algorithm to each half. But the combine is a little more complex because the solution may not even lie in the two recursive calls we made it may lie at the boundary. So the combine has to do some ad additional work. And uh, basically what the combine does is it says, well, if the maximum subway crosses this boundary, then we can simply start a, a counter and start running it that way and start adding up all the cells we see in that direction and until we find the maximum subway that's bounded at that midpoint and we can start another counter and add up all the um, cells as we go this way and find the position that gives us the maximum there. And then the two put together will be the maximum subarray, or in the case of this example right here, it's this, this right here. Uh, so that's the, the strategy for it. And then, uh, of course, this proceeds in a similar fashion. You know, left subarray, right subarray, uh, check also across the boundary. Same thing here, left subarray, right subarray, check across the boundary. So here's the code that does most of the work to, to find the maximum crossing subarray. And it's going to initialize left sums and right sums to the smallest possible value. And then first it's going to start at the midpoint 
and scan left, summing up the elements of the array. And as you go, as soon as you find a new sum that's greater than your previous maximum, you record that as your new maximum and the position at which you found it. And you do the same thing for the right. You reset sum to zero. Uh, now you scan from mid plus one upwards, adding the numbers as you go. And every time the new sum is greater than the right sum, then you record that new right sum and where you found its maximum. And then you return the max left, max right, the two positions, and the two halves sum together. So that was the helper function, and here's the main um, divide and conquer procedure to find the maximum subarray in an array from some low position to a high position. Uh, base case, you only have got one element, so just return that position. Otherwise, divide in half, similar to the binary search, but here we, we call both halves, so we find the maximum subarray in the lower half, and, um, sorry, that's a little error. Uh, this is a multiple value return. It returns multiple values, this notation. Uh, do the same thing for the right half. Find the um, maximum subarray in the right half. But then, uh, and this is not a recursive call, so this is not part of the divide and conquer portion. This is more the, I guess you might say, the combine. It's checking to see whether the solution is actually at the boundary. So call the one that we just looked at on the previous screen. So now we've got three results, and now the rest of this code basically just compares them all and finds which one's the biggest and returns whichever one is the biggest. It's interesting to ask, where is the work actually done in this procedure? What adds up the values in the left and right subarrays? You know, we've got maximum subarray here, maximum subarray here, here. I don't see any place where uh, values are added up. Well, all of the addition is done in this thing. And that means that any maximum subarray must be a crossing subarray of some rec in some recursive call in the um, recursive call hierarchy of this procedure. So coming back to our diagram, how do we write the recurrence relation for this procedure? Well, notice here we have the overall problem, and we're dividing it up into two subproblems. So a is equal to two. And each subproblem is one half the size of the original problem. B equals two, and uh, you know that continues. You know these would be um, so these are size n over two. These are size n over four, and so on. You know it's going to continue on down until eventually these uh, subproblems become of size one. But what about the work done to divide? Well, that's dividing is, um, let's say, d of n is theta of 1. That's just doing the math. But combining requires not just the comparison of the results from the recursive calls, but also computing to see whether the crossing, whether the maximum subarray is a crossing subarray. And that has to uh, run the i index all the way down to the left and the j index all the way up to the right. So we have to include in that the cost of that crossing subarray thing, which is theta of n, because we go all the way down the left and all the way up to the right. So the overall uh, recurrence relation for this is, let's see, let's write it uh, over here. T of n is base case when it's a trivial array. And it is, a is 2, so it's 2 to solve problems of size 1 half of the original n over 2 plus what it takes to divide and combine which is dominated by that theta of n. Notice that that is the same recurrence relation as for the merge sort. We are going to see recurrence relations that have different structure but now we're going to go on to the question of how do we solve these recurrence relations. So that concludes part A of the divide and conquer and recurrence relations screencasts.